All right, welcome. Good evening. Uh, hopefully, each of you has a uh, has a book uh, spot to take notes uh, in the like the craziness busyness of the schedule. Uh, Daniel and I were talking about uh, what to offer for for these final three weeks. Uh, we know some classes that. Uh, kept going, but others had stopped and, and different schedule. And so we figured we would circle up uh, these next three weeks and, and just ask uh, what, what we hope to be uh, really relevant and applicable uh, questions that uh, are near and dear to your heart and uh, that, that we want to talk and wrestle with as, as believers. And so this evening, we're going to be talking about uh, evil and uh, suffering, and uh, how can a good God allow those things to take place? And so um, we will uh, we'll open with a word of prayer. Does any, anyone have, uh, everyone has a book, everyone's ready to go in, in that regard? Okay, anyone have any uh, pressing prayer requests that we could pray about together as a group? Once, <laughs> twice. Yeah. Okay. If you couldn't hear her, her husband's salvation. Her husband's name is Jack, and uh, uh, circled the world, had an incredible life, and uh, has seen Sherry's faith in action for many, many years, and uh, uh, has moments of. Light where you think God's still working on him, and praise the Lord, we will never give up praying for him and, and praying that the Holy Spirit uh, breaks through. Okay, any other pressing prayer requests while we before we open in prayer? All right, we will pray. Also, Miss Lisa is leaving tomorrow on a mission trip, very important one. Uh, and she <laughs> she's going to a difficult region of the world. Am I allowed to say where? Okay, she she's going to Iraq, um, and uh, is is doing some training uh, with churches, actually with people who are going to take the gospel back to Iran. Wow! Um, and so uh, we will we will pray for that. And she leaves tomorrow at noon. Okay. All right. Let's pray, and then we'll jump into our heavenly Father. We thank you for this evening. That the, the ability to gather together to ask important questions about, uh, about your word and, and how we are to interact with, with such an incredible and yet difficult truth of suffering and evil that exists in our world. We certainly pause to remember uh, our dear ones, people we care about and, uh, by name, uh, uh, Jack um, and his salvation. Um, Jack Kasinger, God, that you would save him. We pray in Jesus' name that you would continue to draw him uh, to yourself, God, that if, if there are questions and obstacles that, that are roadblocks and barriers in his life, God, that you would answer them, uh, that you would continue to use believers in his life, God, to shine that light, to stir up a passion and need for you. Father, he needs you. He needs you. You are uh, the wellspring of life. You are the lover of our soul. You give you give water that that is the only thing that can refresh our soul. And so we pray that in Jack's life, uh, we pray that you would use Sherry in any way and that you would use this church in any way that you see fit, God. We look for opportunities. And we also lift up our, our dear sister, Lisa Hilgemeyer, and, and pray for her as, as she goes uh, to the other side of the world, to even a hostile area. God, that you would protect her, that you would give her courage and strength. God, that you would be with her and that you would use her mightily. We are so honored that you use us uh, to, to tell others the good news of Jesus Christ. And so use her and uh, may she know uh, that she's not alone, that, that we're with her and give her courage and strength that comes from us. And we pray that in Jesus' name, amen. 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 You live long enough, uh, undoubtedly you will, you will suffer uh, and you will encounter uh, great evil uh, and great pain. My um, uh, 
uh, when my cousin was 16 years old, it was, it was on his birthday, um, he went over in celebration to a, a friend's house. And uh, without getting into, into too much detail, there was, uh, there was a young lady that he was going to uh, date, take on his first date. And uh, uh, she showed underneath uh, the bed that she had been contemplating suicide and uh, uh, that she had her father's gun. And for some reason or another, at one point uh, that uh, fateful afternoon, she put it to his forehead and pulled the trigger oh. and killed him on the spot. Oh, and you ask the question, where was God? As I saw my aunt and uncle and uh, two sister cousins uh, wrestle with their faith and with that tragedy and with that heartache, where was God? <clears throat> yeah. Um, you know, one that comes to mind, another, a personal example, uh, I'm the oldest of eight kids, uh, and there's a good bit of gap between me and the rest of them. And back in 2011, my father uh, was, was diagnosed with cancer, and within eight months, he was gone and left uh, so many young children, like elementary age kids, and, and what had been a dysfunctional marriage even during that time, this just compounded it. And in the years since 2011, um, just watching the, like Jason said, just the struggle of so many of my siblings, um, of the eight of us, there might be, including me too, who I would say are still very grounded in their faith. And the rest are, are, are running and struggling and grieving, but with a lot of anger. And so it's, you know, and they're all asking that question uh, in their own, in their own ways, where's God in the midst of this? And it's caused a lot of, a lot of struggle. So that's a, as a pastor, uh, one of the privileges uh, that we're often given is, is also one of the, the most difficult circumstances that you can go through. And that is people allow you into some of their deep pain and some of their deep hurt. And uh, uh, I, I once counseled a young lady, let's call her Amanda, um, for, uh, for a lengthy period of time. And she came into my office. She began to unfold a, uh, one of the most horrific stories you've ever heard. It's, it's true, these details. Uh, she, uh, she began to be molested at a very young age by her older cousin. Uh, and then that molestation turned to rape and then uh, the, the horror of it all was in her early teenage years, she got pregnant and her cousin uh, found out she was pregnant and punched her in the belly, causing her to have an abortion. And so all of this compounding over years and years and years, and you ask the question, where was God in all of that? There's, you know, there's other ones too, right? That we could think of, like if we were thinking in categories of things that make us wonder, um, like natural disasters <clears throat> that we would call them, and the, and the and the just sometimes the we wonder why certain things happen, whether it's a, um, you know. Nine, ten years ago, uh, a thriving church over on the coast of North Carolina uh, that had been about to shut its doors seven years before. Um, they're in this great stage of like momentum and God's just doing an incredible work. And then this hurricane comes in and just just decimates the whole the whole area and almost just brings to a just a screeching halt all that God seemed to be doing in that community. And it really just makes you question like, God, why? Why would, why would you allow that kind of suffering and pain um, in a place that seemed to have so much happening that was bringing good and, and glory to the Lord in that area? So that's, a, that's another one that we wrestle with, right? Yeah, you, you, can, you can run through large categories about evil that exists in our world. The shooting in Uvalde, just, just an hour and a half to two hours from here. Uh, you, can, uh, you can look at uh, 
uh, some of the, some of the poorest uh, communities and areas on the planet. Uh, when, when I went and uh, stayed in India for th for three months and did a mission trip there, um, and and began to interact with, with the culture, realizing that the kids as young as ten years old have to leave their family and go work on the street to just to to get food, and and in in some of the darkest areas in terms of of lack of a complete gospel witness in North India. Um, and, and here are these, these poor boys that are, they're so poor, they're working at the age of 10 just to provide food um, and walk out into remote villages that they have zero medical care. And, and I would go out there with a missionary and we, would, uh, we, we were using basic medical care to, to begin to introduce just a relationship so that we could share the gospel. Um, and some of those communities, they, they would, some of, the, some of the elders and leaders of that community would shun us and refuse to allow us to come, keeping that place just dark. And you think through these large categories, and that's what we're going to do tonight, asking this question, where was God? Uh, because in, in reality, um, you, have to, you have to roll up your sleeves and you have to ask these questions and you and if we're honest we're we're stung by them and uh in in part um if i'm honest with you in large part you and i are stung uh, by these certain happenings uh because a lot of times we are completely insulated uh from some of the the great suffering that occurs throughout the world and has occurred historically throughout the world. Um, whether we know it or not, uh, oftentimes uh, we develop an attitude of, of an over there, um, that it's okay or it's expected for certain atrocities to occur over there um, in poorer communities. That's what's normal in the poor areas and the Hispanic and black areas and when those sorts of things happen, but when they show up here, suddenly it bursts our bubble and, and we get shocked. Um, whether you know it or not, uh, we, we live on a, in, in a false security of what our money can buy and the way that it protects us. We live with incredible health care that has brought an expectation that because we are affluent and because we have the best medical doctors in the world, uh, that that should always preserve us from having uh, particular uh, evils or ill come against us. Um, and if we're honest, uh, you and I have adopted an expectation that, that we're guaranteed 75 years of life. And uh, when my father died in his early 70s, we would, we would naturally say, well, well, you know what? He didn't take really good care of himself. And it's not really a tragedy because he, he lived for 70 years. Uh, but, but if he had died at, at the age of 18, uh, then it would be a tragedy. Uh, when, when in reality, guys, the, the death rate is, is one for one. It is guaranteed unto all of us. Uh, that we would die. And, and 70 years has not been allotted to any of us. Um, and so I'm not accusing you of all of this or myself. I am reminding us that so often, uh, whether we know it or not, we have believed in a false sense of prosperity and even self-righteousness that that because we have the protection and things are supposed to happen over there, that whether you know it or not, you, you have begun to believe in it. Well, we kind of deserve this. And, and those are kind of the bad guys anyway. And maybe they're getting some of that. Okay. Um, so we want to have a good, open, honest discussion about uh about how to how to handle and, and what to do with the problem of suffering and evil. Before we dive much further into it, 
uh, one of the things that I want to want to say to you is uh, uh, over the course of the next 30 minutes, maybe 45, we're going to uh, uh, we're going to give an intellectual uh, answer and uh, discussion to the, the problem of evil and suffering. Um, but we certainly want to leave a, a large portion at the end for us to continually be reminded that, guys, listen, first and foremost, when you're dealing with the problem of suffering and heartache and trials in people's lives, people are not responding from an intellectual point of view. Okay. They've been hurt. And uh, so we're going we're gonna to talk about some common missteps here to begin with. And then we're going to walk through a Christian worldview and how to take that. Uh, but we want to leave uh, plenty of time at the end for us to talk about how you actually walk with someone through these trials. The answers that we're about to give, this uh, intellectual assent, um, is, is genuinely to be put in place ahead of time. Okay? Um, you need, as a Christian, to think through critical areas and to have a solid foundation have an understanding of what the Bible teaches and where this goes and that it is complex, okay, ahead of time uh, before you enter into crisis because, uh, because uh, it's, it's like Jesus said, right? You build your house upon the rock. You have that foundation because the storms are going to come, right? That is inevitable with each of us. You live long enough. Uh, your parents are going to die. God forbid your children die. Uh, one of you, your spouse, is going to uh, endure physical ailments. All of these things are going to happen. And so that getting that foundation ahead of time, that's some of what we're laying, but I certainly don't want this to, to feel unpastoral or um, um, detached from reality. Okay, so, so our landing spot, the question we're going to ask at the end is, is how do we walk alongside people? who are enduring suffering and, and what does God call us to do? Um, but it also is very important, and here's where we'll go, uh, as we jump into uh, the, the intellectual ascent to it. I want to give you two quick missteps that we commonly endure in our culture. So uh, you see there are common missteps. Uh, the first one is, is atheism. Okay, what you need to know up front intellectually is that everyone has the problem of evil. Okay, there is no world system that has the problem of evil figured out. Okay, so you, you will commonly interact with people who are not Christians, do not believe in Christianity because of the problem of evil. All right, what I'm about to explain to you is there's no easy out with the problem of evil. Here's why. Atheism as a complete whole system um, cannot actually declare that anything is good or evil. Okay? You hear what I'm saying? There's, there's no foundation. There's no real right or wrong. Everything is relative. Okay? There's no grounding for evil or wrong. Okay? There's no absolutes. Now, um, so when, when, uh, when, when people are wrestling with suffering and evil and hurt in their life, whether they know it or not, they're actually recognizing something's wrong here. This is not the way it's supposed to be, okay? Um, which as we'll work through here, is, is actually one of the necessary things that forces us to wrestle with why is the world the way that it is? Okay, evil is one of those things because if we're honest, if, if man just got what he wanted all the time, he would never turn back to God. He would just keep going whatever direction he wants to go in his own heart, okay? Uh, and, and I'm gonna go really quick over these things. Guys, you can read tons of books on this uh, in terms of this. If you want a great book on this, uh, Mere Christianity uh, by C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis was a former atheist who went through the horrors of World War I. And, and because he was such a great philosophical thinker, what he realized is he knew there was evil. 
and he knew that what was going on around him and it caused him to go, well, atheism actually doesn't hold water because I know that there's evil, okay? So, so this was the wrestling that was in his heart. Um, but, but commonly what you experience around you is, is people who are brought up in a Christian home or a Christian setting, they have suffering and they're like, I don't get that, that Christian God. And they turn to what they say is, well, then I'm just atheist. There is no God, okay? Um, intellectually, it, it actually doesn't make any sense, okay? But we'll circle back around to that. Uh, and then the other thing, the other uh, common misstep um, is this adage. This, this is uh, the way it's commonly phrased. Either God is good and he is not able to stop evil or God is completely sovereign. He is all powerful and in control and he's not good. But both of those things, God being good and God being fully in control cannot possibly be because there is evil and there is suffering. There's a very popular book, uh, I don't know how long ago, maybe 30, 40 years ago, uh, written by a, uh, a Jewish rabbi uh, who had lost his son. And that book was titled, Why Do Bad Things Happen to Good People? And it sold millions and millions of copies. He ultimately came to the conclusion that when given between the choice, either God is strong enough to do something about it, or he's good, I choose a good God. Okay, because I would rather have a good God than a God who didn't do anything about it. His view, his paradigm said that you have to choose between the two because he couldn't work through. All right. Um, and uh, I'll just tell you from a Christian point of view, that just doesn't hold water. That's not the God of the Bible. You cannot lessen uh, the sovereignty of God and just simply choose, well, uh, then, uh, then, then I choose him to be a particular way, all right? And so uh, what we are going to endeavor to do uh, through um, this next section is we're going to ask the question, uh, <clears throat> what is a Christian worldview that gives us... Uh, the pillars to stand up underneath suffering. I'm borrowing completely from this book right here. I have two books to recommend to you. The Reason for God by Tim Keller and How Long, O Lord? Reflections on Suffering and Evil written by D.A. Carson. D.A. Carson gives... Uh, he's given many talks and lectures. You can get this in audio form if you don't want to read books. Uh, the book is great, exceptional. Um, but essentially, uh, that's the presentation that uh, Daniel and I are about to give you is, is a summary of his work. Uh, and it basically goes like this. Um, there's no easy answers. There's no quick fix. You're not going to leave here tonight and go, oh, well, now I've got, I've got step A, B, C. I can, I can bust anyone's chops who ask me any questions, and I'll just solve their suffering problems. It's not the way that this works, okay? Um, the six pillars that you're about to hear are a, are a mature foundation that the the, the Christian worldview stands upon that gives you the tools and the understanding to walk through the trials and the suffering and the evil of life and to see it through the lens of the gospel, of the Bible. This is God's perspective on the world, okay? Something, something I thought about even later this afternoon, uh, we were talking about C.S. Lewis a minute ago and, he, and another book that he wrote kind of on this subject, The Problem of Pain. He talks about this and this kind of fits with kind of the foundation these pillars stand on. So many times we look at the world from a very man-centered viewpoint, right? We, everything is about how we feel, how we think, right? Or how we process through things. And he talks about, hey, the only way that and you know, when we look at it that way, it is hard to reconcile. How does a loving God allow fill in the blank? But he says the problem is 
the universe is not man-centered, it's God-centered. And so when we start throwing it around that way, we're attaching very trivial meaning to that word love, right? When at the end of the day, right, the, the world is, is God-centered and, and we've got to make that distinction, right? The foundation crumbles as long as it's man-centered, right? If we, if we understand it's God-centered, if we understand that we are objects of, of his love, that for him to display his love in and through, if we start there, then that creates a much more solid foundation, I think, for these pillars to stand on. So I think that's another just piece to, to build this on that I thought about as we went through the afternoon. So. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Uh, all right. So pillar number one, insights from the beginning of the Bible. All right. As you think about suffering and evil, uh, it's very important to begin at the beginning of the Bible. And in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and he made everything what? Good. He made everything good, right? Which is according to his character, which is according to his nature. But what happened? Yeah, but man fell. Sin comes into the world. Sin comes into the world, and and when when you work through uh, when you work through the text and the movement and the the biblical storyline of of what God is doing and what God is accomplishing, right? God has created man in His image. Uh, God has made him with purpose. He's made everything good. Uh, but man questions, man is given the freedom uh, to question, and man questions whether staying underneath God's authority is a good thing or not. And man in his own rebellion and heart steps outside of God declaring what is good and says, I will declare what is good myself. And so in the Bible storyline, it's incredibly important. It's pivotal. It cannot be stressed enough to know and to understand that the God according to the biblical worldview is that God is good. God has made things good. He intended for things to be good. But according to his divine plan and opening up opportunity, man sinned and man fell. And with the fall, what fell? The whole of creation. Everything. Everything. Okay? Man himself fell. Now, in God's goodness, did God, <laughs> did God give immediate justice? No. No, because what did he promise would happen if you eat yeah. from that tree? You would die. Did they immediately die? No. Did they die? Yes. yes. It's delayed justice. And delayed justice is filled with mercy. Okay? Because that's going to unravel the plan of redemption. Okay? But it is delayed justice, but the fall does occur. Man falls. Man physically dies. But man is also spiritually dead. And we, and we begin to see the, the chasm and the separation. You immediately see some of that unraveling with, with um, Ab uh, Cain killing Abel. You, you see that, okay? But also in addition to that, all of creation falls. You see that, right? All of creation falls. So everything from a biblical point of view has fallen, even the effects of the entire universe are now underneath the weight of sin and are awaiting God's redemption. This is a huge threat, important, an unmistakable threat as you weave through and as you ask the question about evil and suffering, okay? So that way, when you, when you get to uh, important passages uh, like Romans 1, it is this declaration that uh, all of creation speaks and declares the glory of God, but man in his sinfulness ignores it. He is not thankful. 
and and he he denies his conscience. And then when you get to Romans 3, it culminates in there is none who seeks for God, no, not one. And so you see those lasting huge impacts, that threat as it trickles out. Daniel, talk to us about Luke chapter 13, uh, because this is, a, this is an important passage for, for you to think through. You can flip with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 13, uh, because Jesus in Luke chapter 13 is going gonna, is gonna to give us, there's two quick accounts that are there, and Jesus teaches through those, and, and he says something really interesting in both of those accounts. Yeah, so in, in Luke chapter 13, Jesus points out two stories. One is about uh, a group of Galileans that Pilate had killed, and he took their blood and mixed it with the sacrifices that the Jewish people were offering. And, and so Jesus asks the question, do you suppose these Galileans who were killed or they were sinners than the Galileans who didn't suffer? And then he goes on um, and, and tells them another, proposes another situation. He says, okay, there were 18 um, who were on the Tower of Siloam in verse 4 of chapter 13, and it fell and it killed them. And he says, so were those who were killed by this falling tower... Were they worse sinners than those who were not under the tower and and fell? And his answer for both of those is the same. He says, I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So this is attached to that that thread that Jason is talking about, that there is a reality that we gain from this insight of Genesis 3 that says, you know, the entire world is, is groaning and is, is suffering just because of the effects of sin. And that whether we meet a situation that we would say, terrible accident, right? Horrific thing. It's, you know, there's an element of this that says- yeah, One was an accident and one was an evil deed. Yeah. And in both of those instances, Jesus doesn't say, hey, in that situation, like, do you think these people were worse than everyone else? Actually, he says, listen, all of us deserve that same fate because of this thread from the biblical point of view, uh, sin and the weight and the judgment that has come forth. So let, let's, let's land, I'm going to end this pillar, but let's land on this thought and this thought. Remember the book, Why Do Bad Things Happen to Good People? What's wrong with that from a biblical point of view? There's no one seeking for God. Yeah, no one seeks for God. No, not one. So the, the assumption that's woven in there, now you're not going to earn a lot of friends by going around going, you know, But from the biblical point of view, remember right? these are not points of comfort that we give people in the middle of suffering. Yeah. Right? <laughs> but reality. You know why you're dealing with this. Reality, from God's perspective, none of us got immediate judgment. All of it is delayed judgment. Okay? And, and those of us that have received mercy, none of us was worthy. That's why it's mercy and grace. Okay, that, that creates a particular attitude in us. All right, but when it comes to suffering, so, so insights from the beginning of the Bible, from, from the Bible's perspective, all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. And so when or if judgment comes, right, as bad as it is, we're not saying it's bad, but this is an important thread. You cannot answer this question. There are other threads, but this, is, this one is massive through the scripture. Second one, insights from the end of the Bible's storyline. Insights from the end. So we talked about the beginning, insights from the end of the Bible's storyline. Uh, someone uh, who has your scripture, read for me Revelation 20, 11 through 15. Anyone have their scriptures? Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life, 
And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books, according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every one of them according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Guys, we don't like to talk about this. <laughs> if we could cut out this, this, this one guy who talked about it more than any other person in the whole of Scripture, if we could just get that Jesus guy to stop talking about hell, he's talked about about more than any other person. The reality is, right? We we can we can look at our lives and don't have access to the board, right? We, we can look at our lives and like, like this, is, this is 70, this is the 70 years we think we're, we're promised, right? And if that gets cut short, we're like, that wasn't fair. From the Bible's perspective, right? That's 70 years? In light of eternity? It's nothing, nothing. It's the width of my pinky and the length of this town <laughs> keeps going right it, there's there's no comparison and so the reality of our fall of sin and our standing before a holy god in the light of eternity and a holy judge and the scripture and the scripture would say this listen there is none who seeks for him no not one that god in his wrath gives man over to their own sinful desires in an eternity that that spins off forevermore and away from the presence of the Lord, that first the second Thessalonians 1 9 would say. And, and I would tell you the way the, the Bible puts that in tangible terms for us, and it and it says like it's like being on fire and it never goes out. It's like being thirsty and you can never get a drink. What it's like to be away from the presence of the Lord for all of eternity. And so the reality is, is whatever suffering that we endure here uh, on earth, uh, from one perspective, the suffering that we endure for those, in, uh, for those of us that are going to heaven, um, this is the only hell we will ever know. For those of us that are here on earth, this is the only heaven. This is heaven in comparison to what awaits them to be completely unrestrained and away from the presence of the Lord. And so the perspective, okay, that comes into being in light of hell and in light of heaven. Now let's pause and let's contemplate. Someone someone read uh, Revelation 21, 3 through 5. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Behold, I am making all things new. Right? Yeah, that, and, he said, and he who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Amen. So, the character of God in the scripture is that in the beginning he made all things good. Man felt sin, the consequences, everything that we're enduring. Guys, that, uh, your lifespan, even the whole of human existence exists right here in God all into eternity forevermore will make all things new will make all things right his character <coughs> will be on full display what is one thing that you long for most to be undone Original sin? Yeah, more tangible. 
Yes, yeah, suffering. suffering. Huh? Suffering. Yeah. Our own sins. Huh? My own sins. <laughs> yeah, amen. What about that? Let's give it a first of all. Yeah. Right. Suffering of children. Yeah, I'm ready for people to not be, kids not to be hungry. Yeah. That's an easy fix. Yeah. Okay. It's coming. Our God will make all things new. And his character will be on display. Okay? So insights from the beginning of the Bible, insights from the end. Two important pillars. But we're not done. Let's continue moving. Number three. Uh, the mystery of divine sovereignty and human responsibility. Okay? The mystery of divine sovereignty and human responsibility. Okay, we're gonna get a little philosophical. You can handle this. We'll keep it. We'll keep it uh, Wednesday night appropriate. You're here, all right. But here's the deal: to be a good biblical theologian, and you are, you must hold that these two things are true all through the Scripture. God is sovereign, and man is responsible. God is sovereign. Man is responsible. It's taught all the way through the scripture. Let me give you a couple of, of examples. You guys remember the story of Joseph? Okay. Uh, he, he tells his brothers he had a dream which came from God. They didn't like it. They threw him in a pit, uh, pretended to kill him, sold him as a slave. In their minds, he's long gone. He's probably dead. Dead, good, and gone rises up on the backside, right? God raises him up after 13 years, okay? 13 years, Potiphar's house and in jail and all this mess that he had to go through. Rises up as the number two in command, ends up saving his brothers with a famine, okay? They're reunited. Um, dad dies. There's this pivotal moment in Genesis uh, 50, uh, dad's now gone and out of the way. Brothers are scared. They're, they're, they're about to, he's about to bring, he's the most powerful man in all of Egypt besides Pharaoh. He's about to bring retribution. Joseph's insulted and he makes this monumental statement. What does he say? What you intended for evil, God. God meant for good. Is what they did evil? Yes. <clears throat> Any question about that? Did they intend it for evil? Yes. Did God intend it for good? Yes. Was God sovereign? Yes. Okay. Did God do the evil? No. no. But did God use the evil? Yes. yes. Did Joseph suffer? Did Joseph suffer? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Did God use the evil? Yes. Did he use the suffering? Did God allow us? Here's another critical, critical moment uh, and, and importance in, in the history of uh, well, all time and space. Uh, Acts uh, chapter 2. Um, you, you can flip there. Acts chapter 2, verse 23. Daniel, read it for us. This man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. Okay, the cross. What was the, what was the citation? Acts 2.23, or there's a very similar citation in Acts 4.27 uh, and 28. Okay? How did Jesus die? Uh, who killed Jesus? Who killed Jesus? I'm hearing a lot of different answers. Who killed Jesus? All right, was the pilot's fault? You washed his hands. Was it an evil deed that was done to him? Many, many, many evil deeds. Okay? Was man responsible? 
was real evil done. Let his blood be on us and our children. I think it's exactly what he said. All right. <laughs> but was it God's plan? Yes. 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 Why is it important to understand those two things? Let's let's remove one of them. Let's say man was uh, let's say man was evil, but it wasn't God's plan. The, the way this the, the way this would actually look would be like God saying, "Oh my goodness, I had no idea you guys were going to do that." But <laughs> but because I'm the best chess player on the planet, and I'm always one step ahead of you. You made a move that I didn't know you were going to make. But, whoa, look at that. I checkmated you, and I turned it into something good. Is that what Scripture says? No. 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 What does it say the plan was put in place? From eternity. From eternity past. Okay? From the foundation of the world. Okay, now let's remove. Let's say it's God's plan, but man was not evil, or man was not responsible for it. What's the problem with that? It's not good. Yeah, it, it, it makes no real obligation. Like, if, if you're not culpable and responsible for doing something that evil, literally killing the innocent son of God, well, then how could you be responsible for any sin? If you just say, well, it's all according to the predetermined plan of God. I punched Steve in the face, but hey, God's sovereign, bud. <laughs> okay, are we ever responsible? Okay, you remove that, right? And those two things don't work. So the Bible repeatedly teaches from beginning to end, God is sovereign, he is in control, and man is responsible. You must hold those two things. Now, when you hold those two things, does your head hurt? Yes. Yeah. Sorry, I don't have any fixes for that. I'm just telling you it's reality. It's reality according to the Bible. Okay, the biblical worldview, God is sovereign and man is responsible. Okay, man is evil, man does these. So when you talk about evil deeds, all right, the Bible is very clear. Those are not attributed to God. God does not tempt people to do evil. He does not do evil deeds. And yet, there are scripture passages that talk about him bringing in the Chaldeans, mm -hmm. using them, hardening Pharaoh's heart, hardening Pharaoh's heart mm -hmm. and doing those things. And you have to roll up your hands. You have to say, you know what? It is a mystery. I will hold these things to be true, but I will simultaneously know he's a big, awesome God, and I cannot fully wrap my head around that. But those two things must be true. God is sovereign, and man is evil, or, and man is responsible. Okay? You must hold those. Very important pillar as you're building this. Ready for number four? Gosh, I'm slow. Pastor, I can't say anything quickly. Insights from innocent suffering. Insights from innocent suffering. You will excuse me if I go 100 miles an hour through this, all right? There is innocent suffering. Not uh, So th there is suffering within the scripture that, uh, uh, so in one way, we're all, we're all sinful and we're, we're all deserving of judgment. But in another way, uh, the, the scripture says there's there's innocent suffering. The scripture passage in, in Luke 13, do they do anything any different than the rest of us to receive that? And your prime example is the book of Job. Right, the book of Job. And so you ask a couple important questions. Did Job do anything wrong? Yes. Not, not, he did not do anything that wrong about this. Not according to the scripture, there's that particular spot. Yeah. I mean, the, the scripture exonerates Job. It says, it says that, that Job was, was righteous, that Job was uh, above reproach, that all the accusations that his friends brought against him, none of that was, was true of Job. What happened to him was not in response to a particular sin. Yeah, 100%. Um, Job, Job endured great suffering, the loss of his property, the loss of his children, death of his family. And then on top of that, his health began to fade. And all those things. And, and, and his friends came and accused him and said, listen, God's good, right? I mean, God's good. God's sovereign, right? Well, then you did something. No, I didn't. I didn't. And you work through that entire text. And you know what the answer that's finally given 
me give you the, the paraphrase because I gotta move fast. It's this. Trust God. And <coughs> Job is never given the explanation for what he went through and why he went through it. But trust God. Because what he sees and what he knows in his perspective is greater than what you could ever understand. Now, both the last two things that we looked at, the, uh, the, the sovereignty of God and his ability to, to, to work things out and even his providence and innocent suffering, both of those answers that I've given you are, are truncated. They're cut off because they overwhelmingly point to, like if you ask the question, trust God, trust God. Why on earth should I trust God?